What's up everyone? Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all doing well out there. Now, I swear to God, this is the last Gamdias product I'm gonna be taking a look at for a little while here. They were gracious enough to send over quite a few items from their product stack for me to take a look at. So before I move any further, I just wanna give a huge shout out and thank you to Gamdias for sending these products over for me to take a look at. Now, what we're looking at today is their Athena M2. This is a $100 ATX mid tower that kind of sort of has a lot of the things that I asked for in the Argus M1 review that I did a little while back. So let's dive in and take a look at what this case has on offer and see if it's worth the $100 asking price. Also, before we dive into this case, I wanna remind you, I've started putting timestamps for these types of videos down in the video's description because my case reviews tend to be a little bit lengthy. So if you just wanna jump around to the stuff that's most interesting to you, down in the video's description. So to start off, we'll address the ATX mid-toweredness of this chassis. It is an ATX mid-tower. It's got the seven PCI Express ex expansion slots at the back and it holds a standard ATX motherboard, but it's not quite as deep as a typical ATX mid-tower would be. So this is gonna give you a little bit more room on your desk for activities. Now, probably the most important feature on this case is the front panel. It's a full mesh affair with no dust filter or any plastic bracing in the way of it. So you get nice unobstructed airflow in the front of the case. The mesh itself is also relatively easy to remove and it just clips in with two spring-loaded alligator clips at the top of the case. You may have to tap on it a little bit to get it out, but otherwise it's fine. Now the front panel itself is a standard plastic affair. It's not terrible plastics and it comes off pretty easily and, and stays pretty securely in place. There's only one cable that attaches this to the case itself and that's the one that powers and sends signal to the addressable RGB lighting that flanks the left and right side of the front panel. So while we're up front, let's talk about the fans. There's three of them that come with this chassis. The only thing I really know about them for certain is they're 120 millimeter fans and they use that same proprietary eight pin connector that the Chion E1A 120R heatsink used that I took a look at a little while back. Nowhere in any of the documentation for this chassis do we see any mention of the specs for this fan, uh, neither on the splash page or for the instructions. But taking a look at them, I would speculate these are three of their newest Aeolus branded fans because they look kind of similar to the pictures on the splash page for their website, but they don't actually have any pictures of the new Aeolus fans not spinning. So I can't compare blade designs there. So I'm not gonna commit to giving you guys any specs on these fans. Now, while we're up front, Cooling configurations can consist of up to 320 millimeter fans or 240 millimeter fans. If the documentation were to be believed, it would also be able to technically support two 200 millimeter fans, since at the front of this case, there are technically some mounting points for 200 millimeter fans. The problem, however, is the way this front panel is designed, there is actually zero possibility of you affixing a 200 millimeter fan anywhere on this chassis. Probably the reason it was put there is because this chassis they selected for the Athena M2 is shared with a Raijin Tech case, the Silenos, that also uses 200 millimeter fans, but has an appropriately designed front panel at least to physically accommodate them. For the front I.O. on this chassis, which again is attached to the main body of the chassis itself, we have a USB 3, two USB 2s, headphone and microphone jacks, LED and fan speed control switches, and a power switch. Admittedly, I would have liked to have seen two USB 3 ports rather than one USB 3 and two USB 2, but that's kind of a personal thing. Mostly for me, it's just having uh, the faster data transfer speeds on the USB 3 ports and eliminating an additional cable from front IO. And finishing up the roof of the case, we do have one of the two dust filters that are available on this chassis. It's a little magnetic uh, mesh unit right here. Pretty typical fare. No really sharp edges to speak of along the outside of this, so there's no risk of slicing your hand open like some of these filters tend to do. And you've got accommodations up here for up to 220 or 240 millimeter fans with enough room for a single 240 millimeter radiator. I would speculate that as long as you stick to a 30 mil thick rad up top, you're probably fine. Even with the tall dims that I used for my personal rig in this chassis, the mounts are offset enough towards this left side of the chassis. You're 
you're, you shouldn't have any clearance issues. Now the rear of the case is where we see some of really the only issues that I actually have with the chassis. Rear fan mount gives you accommodations for up to a 140 millimeter fan with 120 millimeter fan hole spacing present as well. And it's nice and open. So whatever size fan you put back there, it should be able to exhaust air effectively. But then we move down to these PCI Express expansion slots. They're all punch out covers, not reusable. So you wind up with some gnarled, nasty mess like this after the fact. Gandius, this is a $100 case. $100 cases should not have these punch out covers on it. I would seriously reconsider your stance with this and include seven replaceable covers for these PCI expansion slots. Also, get rid of this like sliding bracket thing here. It effectively does actually nothing for anything that's connected in these slots. Like it, it doesn't even close enough over the uh, the bracket for my graphics card with any sort of meaningful pressure to help hold it in place while I'm affixing the screws. And while we're back here, it's a pretty standard PSU mounting situation. No uh, no cover plate to uh, to help you slide the power supply in when you install it, and a really cheap, difficult to access power supply dust filter. Thanks, Gamdius. I hate it. Last but not least on the outside is this big. Subjectively beautiful tempered glass side panel that fits more or less flush with the side of the case here. This looks a lot better than what the Argus M1 side panel did, and it even has a um, it even has a mounting system that allows you to keep the side panel in place without necessarily needing to use any of the thumb screws that mount into the side of it. Removing the glass panel. Just be mindful of how you do it because you've got this little uh, knob back here. Admittedly, this could probably be improved upon. It feels really flimsy, just sort of dangling in place there. But when you push it towards the outside of the case, you're gonna wanna have your hand underneath the glass because when the panel pops out, there's really not a whole lot of the glass that's still resting on the chassis. And if this falls onto your desk onto one of those corners, you run a higher risk of breaking this glass panel along with shattering your hopes and dreams as well. Now I do want to mention this glass is very heavily tinted. So unless you've got a lot of addressable RGB components on the inside of your case, you're probably not going to see much of the interior. Now that said, this tint has a bit of a green shift to it. It's not super intense, but I did notice that white lighting especially appeared just the slightest bit green looking through the side panel. So take that into, into consideration when you're adjusting all the lighting for your unique case configuration. All right, so as you can see here, I already have my personal rig installed into the case. and. By and large, this, this, this chamber was really easy to work with. I did need to install three of the motherboard standoffs myself, but that's really not a huge deal at the end of the day. The front end of the motherboard tray sticks out a little bit further than the rest of it, just to give you some cable management room behind it, and does include accommodations for up to two, two and a half inch uh, hard drives or solid state drives. And there are some cable cutouts along the uh, along the, that area of the motherboard tray to make cable management relatively easy if you do decide to use those mounts. You've also got some vertical slots that run in two different locations there. Not entirely certain what those are for. I would speculate that they're there so you could mount a um, uh, an open loop cooling reservoir, but I would advise against using that particular mounting location unless you're okay with just having a 240 millimeter radiator at the top. Because if you mount a tube res there with your pump, you're not gonna have enough room in the front of the case to set even a 30 millimeter radiator. Apart from that, there's ample cable routing openings all along the motherboard tray area and on the top of the power supply shroud. So you shouldn't really have any issues running any of the cables from your power supply or the front IO. Now let's quickly touch on the PSU shroud before we get back into the cable management area out back. There is a little cutout here on the side so you can view your power supply if it's got some fancy artwork on it or it has some addressable RGB lighting on the side. And it does have a meshed top, at least partially mesh. And technically there's room for 220 millimeter fans on the top of the power supply. And this time, they actually give you all of the fasteners needed to mount those fans. Just bear in mind, however, if you're routing the USB 3 cable for your front USB 3 port towards the bottom of the case near the power supply shroud, 
that cable is gonna stick out enough that you will not be able to mount any fans down here at all. So just keep that in mind if you were planning on mounting some fans down there for your GPU. All right, so let's flip it around and talk cable management. All right, so now we have a full view of the cable management area back here, and you can see there's not really there's not really actually a whole lot of places to effectively run the cables, but you don't really need to, and neither do you really need many tie-down points. And in point of fact, there aren't many tie-down points. You really only need to route the majority of your cables through this recess in the motherboard tray area right here. Now that being said, there is still some excess room down in the power supply basement if you need it but keep in mind the length of the power supply that you use if you're using the Athena M2. Now this green PCB right here is essentially a sort of updated and purpose-built version of the Aeolus control box that came with the, uh, the Chion E1A120R that I took a look at previously. It's got the same kind of layout. We've got six connectors here for up to six of those proprietary Aeolus fans. We've got two headers for other LED equipped devices. In this case, it would be the case front panel and an associated all-in-one, which by the way, this is compatible with the Chion E1A that I reviewed, even though that's a previous gen product. So I like to see that reverse uh, compatibility there. Now where the differences lie is obviously this isn't repositionable with the little magnets that the other Aeolus box had. Also, you can't control the brightness or the speed of the addressable RGB lighting effects here. You can only control the mode. And as far as fan speeds are concerned, you don't have the same granular range either. You've got three speed settings, low, medium, and high. Currently, I'm running these fans on the high speed setting, and I'm not really certain how much of the fan noise you can pick up right now, but again, even at top speed, these fans are actually relatively quiet. Now, if we look towards the back there, we can see that there's only one two and a half inch drive sled that's mounted behind the tray, even though, if you look at it, there is actually enough room to mount a second one. The reason they didn't include a second one is because they would have had to mount the trays vertically. And mounting them vertically would interfere with this piece of bracing right here. What this is, is where the motherboard tray and the power supply shroud wrap around each other and get riveted together. This creates enough structural rigidity that it kind of overcomes the thinner sheet metal that was used to construct this case. It's a nice touch, but unfortunately you can see it does limit some of the, some of the options that could have been with this case. Now though you can't see it in the rat's nest right here up front, uh, this is not one of my finer moments for cable management. I am so sorry. But there is a single three and a half inch drive hard drive caddy down here. Now it can technically mount up to two three and a half inch drives if you mount one on the top prior to mounting one inside the main caddy, or you can mount a two and a half inch drive on top along with a three and a half inch drive. The only issue that I really had with the caddy is it feels kind of flimsy in hand. It's very obvious they use the same sheet metal for the caddy that they did for the rest of the case stands to reason. The other main issue that I had here is that you can't move it forward far enough for, uh, for a particularly long power supply like the Antec HCP850 unit that I'm using here. It's not necessarily the fault of the case. This power supply is long enough, I can't actually bolt this down to the floor of the case, but there is enough room up front that if the floor pan of the case was designed just a little bit differently, there is technically enough room for a third set of mounting points to move that cage closer to the front. Now the hard drive cage is held in place from underneath the case with two mounting screws. Lo and behold, removing these screws had the paint doing the same exact thing it did on the uh, Argus M1 that I took a look at. It just, it flaked off really easily. There's also another section back near the power supply area where the paint did something very similar. I personally would like to see the paint undergo better QC checks because it's apparent that the finish here isn't as durable as it could be. It's unreasonable to expect this paint to ever be bulletproof on a case. No paint is invulnerable but neither should it flake off like this stuff's doing. It doesn't portray uh, the kind of quality that you would expect out of a $100 case. All right, so let's quickly touch on the addressable RGB implementation here. 
It's actually surprisingly clean. I personally think this looks even better than the Argus M1 implementation on the front panel. The lighting is really well diffused, transitions between colors are really solid, and as you're seeing on the screen right now, the pre-programmed settings actually look really damn good. Now, you can synchronize this lighting with your motherboard, so if you're using an ASUS, MSI, Aorus, or an ASRock motherboard that has their associated uh, RGB lighting control system on them, and there's an addressable RGB header that's freed up, you should be good to go. And I can actually confirm compatibility with RGB Fusion 2.0 since that's what this motherboard uses. All right, so let's talk thermal performance because that's really gonna be one of the biggest selling points for a case like this that has a full mesh front panel. While I throw the results up on the screen, I wanna mention a couple of things. First of all, my testing system and methodology are listed down in the video's description for those of you that are interested. But the other thing to note here, while the B-roll is showing my MSI RTX 2070 Gaming Z, my testing was done with an EVGA 1080 Ti. The other thing to note is that the Argus M1 and the Meshify S2 that I tested with were using a different fan configuration. Those cases were using six Fractal Design Prisma AL12 PWM fans at a fixed 1000 RPM. Whereas the only fans that I used for testing the Athena M2 were the included fans, and they were run at their peak fan speed, which I speculate may be around 1500 RPM. But again, without knowing exactly what these fans are, I can neither confirm or deny that. But we can see here, out of the box thermals are actually pretty damn decent with this case, especially considering it had half the quantity of fans that the other case configurations had going for them. All of my clock speeds for my CPU and my GPU were also remaining more or less in the same general range as they did in any of the other cases that I've tested recently. So as far as thermal performance is concerned, there's really nothing to worry about with this case. All right, it's conclusion time with the Athena M2. Let's talk about the good stuff first, because there's actually quite a few good things with this case. Thermals, no complaints here. Out of the box, thermals look really solid for this case. And as a result, the cooling potential is still there too, because remember, there's up to five more fan spots that you can populate on this chassis to get even more air moving through the case, assuming, of course, you need it. Remember, your individual configuration may vary in terms of what is and isn't effective for you uh, as far as fan size and placement is concerned. I also like the physical footprint for this case. Because it's more shallow than a typical ATX mid-tower, there's just gonna be more room on your desk and it's gonna make it easier for you to keep everything laid out exactly the way you want it to and not have this get so much in the way. Cable management is also really solid here. I mean, there's really not a whole lot of places you can route the cables, but that's kind of a good thing. It takes some of the thought out of it and allows you to just basically slap everything in there like I did and know you're not gonna have any problems getting the side panel closed on this thing. And that's especially true if when you populate more fans into this chassis, you stick with the Aeolus branded fans that plug into the control hub back there. Since it only has one cable, you don't have to deal with the additional addressable RGB cable spaghetti monster nightmare that tends to happen with addressable RGB lighting configurations. And on the topic of lighting, I'm a huge fan of the lighting implementation here. I mean, right now I'm using one of the stock lighting configs and it, it looks killer. And lastly, noise. Because all of my hardware was kept nice and cool and because these fans are actually pretty decently well built, this case really doesn't make a whole lot of noise. So it's gonna stay out of the way for those of you that don't use headphones while you're gaming. But there is some bad with this case, uh, chief of which are some build quality concerns that I had. The thinner sheet metal I can sort of excuse considering how they went about bracing the chassis to give it more structural rigidity. What I was not a fan of, however, was the fact that they just kept these punch out PCI Express expansion slots. I really, that doesn't feel good on a $100 case. I'm also kind of bummed that the control hub still doesn't provide PWM fan speed control for any of the Aeolus fans here. Remember, that proprietary connector means you can't just hook these into a motherboard header and expect to be able to control fan speeds. You basically just have the three fan speeds that are set for the top of the case. Also not a fan of how difficult it is to access the power supply dust filter and ultimately how cheap that solution is. And then lastly, the mention of 200 millimeter fan support here is kind of disappointing. 
There's one of two things they need to do here. Either one, they need to revise the front panel so that it still has that clean meshed front look with the addressable lighting running down the side and still allow you to accommodate 200 millimeter fans or they need to just straight up remove it from the documentation entirely. But even all that said, this is actually the strongest showing from Gamdia so far. At its $100 price point, again, this is a really heavily contested market and there's a lot of really strong cases at that price point that for the money, I personally would consider before the Athena M2. But if you can pick up the Athena M2 on a discount, like if you can find it on sale for somewhere around like 80, 85 bucks, it's actually not a bad case. Anyway, sound off in the comments down below. What do you think of the Athena M2? And those of you out there watching that have built in this case, what were your build experiences like? Did you have any of the same issues with the paint that I did? Uh, were there any other build quality concerns that you had? Because I'm certain Gamdius is going to be taking a look at this video, and I know they would love to hear about anything that they need to address with this moving forward. And as always, toss a thumbs up on this video if you liked what you saw. Make sure you get subscribed and hit that little bell icon to make sure you're caught up every single time I I upload another video and I'll catch you all next time. So take it easy.